Okay, hi everyone. Um, apologies ahead of time. We have the kids coming home from soccer, so um, hopefully that doesn't cut into this. But uh, like everything with Zoom meetings now, it's always a little bit of a mess figuring it out and scheduling it. But anyways, um, so yeah, we're Romy and Ryan at Circle R. We are here in Southern Ontario. We are about half an hour from Kitchener Waterloo, about an hour, hour and a half to two from most spots in Toronto. Um, too glad we uh, we can't be in person <laughs> in Alberta. We're actually planning a trip out there in August, so we're super excited about that. No, the trip is booked. We're going. Yes, it's planned. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll do like a little quick overview and then cover um, about how we're doing accelerated lambing and breeding on the farm. So we started as a mixed farm. We took over from Ryan's grandparents. There was uh, beef, uh, sows, finish, and chickens. And it was Ryan's experiment to start with sheep. So there was 25 sheep at the very beginning. And that old barn there that you see in those middle two pictures needed a lot of work. Um, and when it came, to the, came time to decide what we really wanted to do, um, sheep was that big decision. So we renovated parts of that barn slowly and slowly increased the flock. So by about 2018, we had slowly renovated, um, built up the flock and that kind of thing to about 400 ewes. Uh, we started with some random crossbreds. Then we decided on dorsets. Then we added in some Rideau, Rideau cross. Um, and then with our big expansion, we added in another prolific mix. Romy, I'm just gonna stop you for one second. Um, I'm just getting some messages that the um, attendees are having a really hard time hearing you. Um, I'm just wondering, maybe calling in instead um, of doing the computer audio might make a difference maybe. Give me a second. Sorry to interrupt there. I just want to make sure everybody can hear you. Oh, I've got some people now saying that they can hear just fine. So maybe it's just their their service for those who can't hear. All right. So we'll just sorry. We'll just pick up if there's majority people can hear. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm dialing in, and if you want to mute me, because I can't get back to my mute button now. Wait. Sure. Okay, I don't think that's working. I can't hear anything back if anyone was answering. Okay, so we'll just continue on. I'm getting more people saying they can hear you. So my apologies for that. Okay, I'll try to talk louder. Um, okay. <laughs> so yeah, we're, so we're somewhere around 700 views. Uh, we could probably fit upwards of 900, but we've kind of just been slowly growing. Um, and then we have 2,800 layer breeder hens. Those go in sort of, you can see at the back, the big silver barn there. Um, we're planning on getting rid of those in the next couple of years as we kind of fill up the sheep barn and focus more on the wool side of the business too. Um, so our goals are producing quality meat and breeding stock. Um, most of our ewe lambs are sent uh, you know, if we're not keeping them back as replacements, we're able to sell them as uh, breeding stock to other farmers. We do rams as well. Uh, the wool is now a big part of the business. Uh, we focus on land stewardship, um, try to improve the industry, share knowledge, and tell the story. So most of you guys probably follow me or um, we follow each other on Instagram or social media. So the farm is Circle Our Lamb. Um, and then there's the wool too. So that's Revolution Wool Company. So that's kind of become a more serious part of the business. And it's been a nice way to add some value to something we're already doing. So I think last year and this year, um, we've been able to use all of the wool um, 
and actually get it milled to use for the different products for the shop. So we do yarns, pillows, bedding. We do handmade things like felt and dryer balls, sheep and lamb skins. Um, so yeah, that's kind of been a cool way to expand the business and um, connect with consumers in a completely different way because it's different than sort of the um, traditional food type connection that we have uh, to our customers. But it's the same idea, just like how people are interested in local food, they're also interested in local fiber and um, where their textiles come from. Uh, and that's, yeah, a Revolution Wool Co. on Instagram. And shameless plug, find us on our website. We've got a great store on there. Do you want to do some talking? You could. <laughs> Ryan does do a lot. He just sort of is always in the background. Everyone usually just sees me. <laughs> so 2018, we made the big jump um, to expand. We built the new barn. Um, and yeah, was it 2019? Both of us were kind of home officially full time. Before then, we had both kind of taken turns working off the farm, uh, you know, juggling kids in a couple spots at daycare, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, 2018 was a big change. Um, and we built the new barn and we haven't looked back. So we're using mostly the new barn for close-ups and lambing. The old barn is mainly used for breeding groups. It's got some smaller pens. Uh, there's also an outside yard. There's a picture of the outside yard. So we have the J bunks out there. Um, that's also been a nice way to expand as we just set those bunks up outside on a cement pad. Um, usually the early gestation ewes go out there. Uh, for feeding, that's a big one for us. We really keep an eye on nutrition. It's sort of our number one for making sure the sheep are healthy and can do for us what we need them to. So right here, um, we've got some really good opportunities as far as our land and soil quality. So we can do three to four cuts of haylage. We can get a really good yielding corn silage crop. Um, we've also added in cob meal um, for the extra energy in the ration. That's worked really nice. Protein, uh, we were using soy. We're now on to dried distillers and custom minerals for a couple of the different groups. Courtney Reens does all of our nutrition. So she um, tests all the feed and then makes all the rations for the different groups. Uh, yeah, we're always kind of keeping an eye on cost of production, that kind of thing. Um, took a lot of work to get here. Like we started with small squares and buckets of corn, like a lot of people do. And we've done that and everything in between. Um, we still kind of do baleage um, every year. We've done peas and oats. We did uh, winter rye this year. So we've done the gamut of different feeds for sheep, but uh, we really do like TMR um, for all the sheep. Um, the lambs. We're doing now a homemade creek feed and cob meal finisher feed, um, milk machine for the extra, for the bottle babies. So that's worked really nice. Um, what is next? A little bit of basics. Um, yeah, lambs are born. They go into the lambing jugs. They're getting tagged right away, weighed, and you know any extra notes on if mom you know an underscore for mom that kind of thing weaning at around 60 days and we target a market weight of 100 to 110 pounds usually that happens by about four or five months of age and our goal is to have a consistent supply so when i get into talking about breeding we're doing sort of three lambings in two years and four groups so it kind of equals a lambing group every other month and usually when the last of the heavy lambs are gone, the next group is getting weaned. Um, did I miss anything there? Does anyone have any questions? We have a break right there. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I said, Feeding's a big one for us, uh, nutrition. And another one is benchmarks that we found really important on our operation. Um, and this was huge actually when we expanded. 
and approached the bank to get the money to get more sheep and to build that barn. So, you know, figuring out um, what's your milk tank. For most sheep producers, the milk tank is your growth rate on those lambs. Um, you know, we're not seeing that uh, milk tank per se like a dairy farmer would. Uh, so we need to figure out a way to track that. So we're using the BioTrack program, um, which also gives us our Genovis genetic evaluation numbers. Everything goes in there for the sheep. So keeping track of lemming rates, weight gains, all that fun stuff. And for crops, you pretty much have everything tracked to per acre. Um, we've got all of our feed costs figured out per head per day per sheep in the different groups. So um, we can all sort of tie that back into how things are going and then track any changes we've made. Um, and then, yeah, kind of the whole know your numbers and industry trends. Um, you know, we might be targeting 110 pound heavy lambs. Um, some farms might not be able to do that depending on breed. So just knowing what breed can do what um, and what market weights you need to target for those sorts of things. Um, yeah, and if you know what's going on, it's easier to make decisions and do those improvements and fine tuning. There's just a couple of questions that have come in through the chat box. Do you have access to that by chance? Let's see. All right, there we go. Coccidiosis was on the screen. Um, yeah, so we're doing uh, coccidiostat in the creep and the market feed. Um, we've had our share of issues. For the most part, we can keep it under control um, flare up in with the, it. Yeah, with the coccidiostat. It, Ryan just said it does flare up. We had an August once where like we actually had gone on a vacation and came back and there was poop everywhere and we had never experienced that before. So, you know, sort of heat stress, August kind of stuff. Um, and I think that was also when we switched from Avitec or like we had been on Avitec as the Cox Studio stat for a while. And I think we just switched back to Decox. So little things like that. Uh, but yeah, if you can get a handle on it and- Lime in the pen between each lamb group too. Yeah. Did everyone hear that or does he need to speak up? Um, after weaning, um, we clean out the pens and we lime, put lime down for each pen as well, um, which seems to help. We've done a bunch of little things. I think that added up to keep it under control now. But uh, switching to decox, pay more attention to that actually, and um, just a little bit better eye on things during the summer months. Yeah, and intakes too. You can have your coccidiostat in your feed, but if your lambs aren't eating what they what they're supposed to based on their weight, um, it's not going to help. So keep an eye on that. Um, hired help. We have time right now, actually, which has been really awesome. Um, that's been good. She knows what's what's going on, and we can get away a little easier. Not that we have yet, <laughs> um, but we kind of hired her and thought, oh, you know, we're not sure if we have enough work for her and we've had plenty of work. Um, we're still not caught up on all those jobs. We thought we could get done with extra help, but that's always how it goes. Um, lamb skins. So uh, it is economic, well, economical is a loose term. A loose term. <laughs> It's all in how you carry those costs. So we actually have a tannery about an hour away from us, the only tannery in Canada that does it at any scale. So for us, that's been really good. We can take our lamb in there um, and get them processed. And then, it, I mean, economical, it's a matter of um, what I charge my customers for then and making sure that works for um, the business that way. And yeah, EID, so we're using BioTrack and TrueTest. So TrueTest is we've got the wand and we've got the Kami Clamp uh, handling system with a scale on it. So that's made all of that pretty easy. 
Um, oh, something else I was going to add um, for coccidiosis, um, straw, same thing, you know, mastitis, that kind of stuff, straw, straw, and more straw, especially in the barn. Um, straw is a lot cheaper than dead sheep or having to medicate sheep. So we're uh, always making sure we bed down as much as we can. Um, and that really depends on the weather and what's going on. Um, so yeah, just making sure they're dry. If you don't want to lay down in it, um, you better get some straw in there for the sheep. Good. All right. I don't see any other ones. Yeah, I did that one. All right. So breeding. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're doing, it's about four groups and we cycle those four groups year round. Um, so it kind of starts at weaning where we are doing our pre-breeding vaccines, um, call check, that sort of thing. We're doing a pre-breeding vaccine for Q fever as well as chlamydia. Um, hopefully we've got those things under control. Um, I think maybe like most sheep farmers, we've had our fair share of, you know, everything's going good and all of a sudden you get, you know, an abortion storm or something like that. But uh, knock on wood, things have been good. Um, having that vaccination program in place, I think, has really helped. Um, so, yeah, uh, after weaning, approximately four weeks later, rams are put in. Um, to that, I will add that we don't let, typically don't let use raise triplets even though they could um use milk machine because they're getting weaned or because they're getting bred four weeks after weaning they don't have time to catch up and gain back that weight to have a, a good strong uh, breeding so we will leave twins with most of the use um we are lambing in the new barn will wean and then bring those ewes back to that same pen so they actually haven't seen a ram uh since they were in the old barn or at breeding time so i think that has helped with our out of season and just breeding success we also have timer lighting timers in the new barn so the lights are always on for the same amount of time each day which i think also helps decrease the variability in any uh, day length and then yeah once they're weaned at about two weeks after weaning three weeks, we will start them on the flush ration and put teasers in. So just for those of you don't, who don't know, uh, teasers are vasectomized rams. So they are a fully functional ram. They have just had their tubes cut. So you can't use a castrated ram. He needs his testicles. It has to, you need to have a vet in to do that. So those guys have worked uh, really good. And then, <clears throat> Yeah, once teasers are done, uh, rams are in for 25 days. We were doing 35 days. I think that's sort of like an industry kind of standard, you know, rams in for 35 days. Um, but we've always found that after about that 21, 22 days, there's just a bunch of stragglers. So might as well pull the rams out. And for us, most of the time when we ultrasound, it's about the same time as the next breeding group. So if they didn't happen to catch in those 21 to 25 days, they just float on to the next group for one more try. Rams, usually one to 20 to 25, maybe a little bit less uh, when it's out of season or during the summer. We've also found when we're doing multi-sires, we can push those numbers a bit just because there's a bit more competitiveness in the rams. Uh, there was a couple of questions, Romy, that came through. If you would like, I can read them to you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the first one was, do you use cedars to help cycle the use? I'm getting there. <laughs> oh. Yep. Okay, so we'll wait for that. Um, and then how many use per teaser ram? We have four teaser rams and we'll grab at least two or three um, depending on how many groups or what kind of pen size is. Um, okay. you should use and then to what you're using ram, real rams. Then 
there was another question is when is the flush ration? Two weeks before the real rams go in. So the same time as the teasers is the flush ration. Okay. Another question was, do you ultrasound yourself or hire it? If you do yourself, what system do you use? Yeah, so I'll cover that in the next slide. Um, okay. Yeah, so flush ration is two weeks pre and two weeks post breeding. That also depends a little bit on body condition. Um, we have had some really, we've been working a bit on, on fine tuning the lactating ration. We did have a group get really fat and we didn't flush them at all. They had way too much condition on them. At about, what is it, body score three and a half, flush ration is not gonna do anything. They're already so fat. Um, they're conditioned. <laughs> They've had enough cookies. They don't need the extras for breeding. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll answer those couple questions now. So we get um, our vet clinic, our vet tech comes in at 50 to 60 days and we ultrasound. Generally, we are just doing um, open or bred with our breeds. We've never found it um, we never have enough singles or enough like triplets and quads that it makes sense sorting out groups, um, but it is an option for us. Uh, she can count if we wanted to. Um, and we, we also know based on their ear tags um, who the prolific use are and who the more dorset based use are. So that gives us an idea too, especially if we're going into landing, you know, if a Dorset has had a really nice set of twins. We're good with that. We usually don't need to check, but if there's a prolific you, you know, who's had two, you know, smaller ish lambs, we better go in there and check for a third, maybe a fourth. Um, and then we have done it. We actually split depending on group size and what's going on. We will sometimes split after lambing. We will keep the ewes that have singles as a separate group and the ewes who have twins. Um, as another group and more limit feed the ones that are only raising a single so they don't get as fat. Um, yeah, so it's all planned out those four groups. I've got this Excel sheet where we just kind of all the formulas flow its way through and we know what's gonna happen and when. Um, and yeah, the magic question, seeders, they're not all they're cracked up to be. Um, we don't seeder anything. Um, we did do some, AI and we would have we seedered for that but other than that uh, we don't seeder and I think that's a bit of a uh, misconception um, especially right now with a lot of the discussions that have gone on on Facebook the last couple years um, seeders are not they're not the magic bullet so I will talk about that because I got some information for you guys um, so just for our breeding groups here, we're doing groups of about 180, about 12 rams per group. Um, I took some averages here just to show you guys how things are working. So on average, throughout the year, mature ewes are about 80%. Um, that's, that was 27 groups um, since about 2017 that I figured. And I counted, there was four flops in there. Uh, one of those flops was like super hot, hot August. Another flop was young rams and this, a couple other things. So uh, for the most part, it's about that 80% for mature use. Ewe lambs I find are a bit more of an up in the air thing. Um, we average about 65%. I did ignore three groups in there that were just awful. It was kind of like a summer breeding ewe lambs, but we kind of figured, heck, we'll throw the rams in. If they breed, they breed. If not, they go to that next breeding group anyways. Um, we are attending more though to do those ewe lambs for a fall breeding. And just some, yeah, some other stats. Mature ewes drop about 200%. Ewe lambs, 150 Mortality, uh, roughly 15%, zero to 10 uh, days and 5% for 10 days to wean. Um, yeah, we have had a couple groups in there. Um, we had two, three groups out of those 27 that we had some abortion issues. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, 
um, the last couple groups have been seven to eight percent uh, mortality. So that's been really exciting. I think we've got with those vaccines and stuff, we've got some of that uh, stuff under control. It's really exciting. So cedars, big question. Um, <laughs> we have never found cedars have helped us achieve better than what we can do with natural breeding. We have found here that proper feed and sheep health um, is as much of a bonus for breeding as anything and also um, your breed. And we've been, we've had sheep for 15 years now and the last probably at least 10, we've been doing the out of season thing. And I think that time and selecting for those ewes, um, they're just used to our system and what we're doing. Uh, cedars can be a good option if you need to plan ahead or you have an off-farm job. So, you know, say you want to take a week off work to make sure you're home for lambing. It can be a really great option. Um, it can cost a lot. It's at least $15 per head plus your time um, and the energy it's going to take to get those sheep handled each time. So you're going to need to insert the cedar. Then you need to put them through again to take out the cedar and give them their... Um, Polygon shot. So it's a couple extra times of handling and you're going to need a lot of rams. So that's something else to consider. Um, so yeah, maybe you don't want a lot of rams, but then you're going to be doing a lot of smaller groups to make sure your rams aren't overworked. Um, I had some numbers from a friend who does um, some cedar stuff. And they said that, yeah, the majority lamb at four to seven days. And then if they didn't catch in that first cycle, the second set will lamb at about uh, 17 to 23 days. Um, I do know some farmers, they will induce. So if they, so they will do the dexamethasone on Friday morning and everyone lambs by Sunday night, I believe. So if, you know, if you really do need to time everything, um, it can be a good option. And cedar and ewe lambs, some people do it, some people don't, some vets recommend it, others don't. Um, that would be a question to have with your vet if that's something um, you might want to do. Uh, so this is an example from the friend of ours um, who went through and just did um, some success numbers. So uh, as you can see, uh, there's sort of that 80 to 90% on mature ewes, and depending on the group, the ewe lambs were as low as 40% and upwards of 90%. So um, <clears throat> it just shows like it, I don't know if there is a benefit other than actually having them synchronized so you can organize your life a little bit better. Um, but yeah, like I said, for us, we've never found an increase in conception. We also never found an increase in lamb drop rate, which you can bump up that dose a little bit, but that gets a little tricky. Does anyone have any more questions about that? Uh, there was one question that came through and it said, why is your mortality rate mortality so high in the first 10 days is that still birth and abortions included that does include abortions and it's actually not high anywhere from 10 to 15 percent i believe is sort of an industry um standard you like it to be lower i oh, i'd love it to be lower um i i almost <laughs> Maybe don't take this the wrong way, but I call bullshit on anyone who says they have like 5% mortality on it, like a regular basis or something like, you know, you get one that's laid on, you get one born in the bag, you, you know, you add up a couple of those things and all of a sudden you're easily at like 10%. Um, so yeah, I think unfortunately a lot of people don't count, you know, if it is an abortion, you count that as that mortality in there. Maybe like we keep it separate, like regular lambing mortality versus abortion mortalities. Um, but yeah, if you have a mummified lamb, you know, count everything that drops out of that you. Um, if you're if you're consistently below like eight to 10%, like I want to know the secret because <laughs> after 15 years, we can't figure that one out. Did you just have a second question? Yeah, no, I said we got like 
we've had a couple groups that were like six, seven percent, and that's pretty awesome. We get pretty excited about that, and we don't know why. Like the group we're doing right now has been amazing, and we didn't necessarily do anything different um, than previous groups. Thank you for that. Um, I think some of this was from another presentation, but I thought I'd leave it in here and then yeah, guys feel free to hit us with all the hard hitting questions. Um, be serious and be in it for the long run. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential in the sheep industry. Um, we like to say think of it like being a dairy farmer. You're in it for 15 to 25 years. And when you think of it that way, um, you know, you can consider investing in different equipment or buildings or you can consider how you want to get your kids involved. Yeah, those are our kids, by the way. <laughs> I don't think I said that. Uh, they are 11, 9, and 7 now. Um, and yeah, you know, in the long term, invest, you know, get things that make life easier, get a handling system. Um, if you've got 100 ish 100 sheep, get a handling system. It makes life so much easier. If you don't have to wrestle with them, and stress yourself and hurt yourself and rowdy up the sheep, it's worth it. Um, get lots of gates, good quality feeders, good water bowls. Um, I, I see too many people that are still filling buckets with water hoses when there's so many awesome options for water bowls that can ensure your sheep are always getting clean water and you don't always have to go do it. Um, you know, if you can renovate the barn a little bit to get in there with a skid steer to clean it out versus a fork, that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, like, like we started, we did all that. Um, but the goal was always to do it full time. And if there was something we could invest in to make that easier in the future, uh, that's what we work towards. Uh, good sheep genetics, plan ahead. Um, it's really hard to find good sheep genetics. We're sold out for about the next year and a half, two years. So you can't just call up most breeders like, hey, you got anything available? Um, I for sure don't have red ewes available. I for sure don't have red ewe lambs available. Our ewe lambs are available at three to four months old after weaning, um, and that's in two years. So you need to plan ahead for that. Um, yeah, I guess that's all there. Time management is a big one. Um, yeah, like we're, breeding, we're, we're scheduling breeding, scanning, vaccinating, all of that. Um, if you get a bit of a flow in your system, it's really easy to do that and know what's coming up. Keeping those breeding sh days short really helps with that. Um, you know exactly when it's going to be busy with our 20-ish, 25 days. We know about week two and three, it's going to be super busy. Uh, maternal lines. Um, yeah, get sheep that know how to have babies. Unless they're, you know, busting out at the seams. I really don't think people need to be up at night checking on sheep. Uh, they should be able to give birth themselves and know what's going on. You need those maternal instincts. Otherwise, you're going to exhaust yourself doing all of that extra checking on them and babying them. Um, delegate. Use your nutritionist, your vet, your banker. Get them to do maybe the things you don't like or hire someone part-time to do the jobs um, that you need help with. You know, if you need someone to help with weaning day, hire someone for weaning day. Um, yeah, make sure you take time off, take a vacation, that kind of thing. And yeah, have a good attitude. Sheep industry is pretty awesome. Uh, we've loved it. And yeah, there's a lot of potential. And I also always like to say, be a positive voice. Um, it does a lot for our industry when we show off how awesome it is. So, um, you know, those, those silly questions like, oh, you must be up all night lambing. Well, no, I'm not, you know, it's not that strenuous. And the one I like to tell people not to say is sheep just try to find ways to kill themselves, which makes sheep farming not sound like fun. Um, when most of the time it's our fault for sheep finding ways to kill themselves. That's not the sheep's fault. So uh, yeah, stay positive. Uh, there's a lot of potential in our industry and hopefully um, we can get more people growing their flocks and getting new producers in. There, I feel like I, 
it's <laughs> just really going on. So hopefully that gives you guys an idea of what's going on and what we're doing. But yeah, hit us with all the hard hitting questions. We're by no experts. Uh, there's lots of different ways, um, lots of different ways to do it. We've done a lot of them. We've you know seen other people do a lot of different things too. So yeah. No. Oh, there's, yeah, there's another good point. So no, we don't have a livestock guardian dog. Our sheep actually always stay in the barns. So they're not on, on pasture. So we can actually avoid livestock guardian dogs. And we also don't have to treat for any intestinal parasites. Education resources. Um, yeah, Ontario sheep. Yeah, and you guys, Alberta sheep. There's some really good stuff on the websites. And I'll just grab my favorite book. You guys can see that. That's a good one. What is it? David C. Henderson. There's a couple other ones. I think we got them from wool growers. And, oh, there's that beginner one. The like the stories guide to sheep raising. That has some good basic information on it too. Um, yeah, and reach out to other farmers. Um, we started with zero sheep knowledge. So um, we had to ask around and figure it out too. So you can ask an experienced sheep farmer. There's a, there's a good start too. What square footage per you? Uh, dry used to be around 15 and use is now. Dry you use. talk to the screen. <laughs> dry use for about 15 square foot a you and uh, use with lambs, I think in the new barn they're about 23 to 25 square feet. A U. Uh, the new barn measures uh, 98 by 146 on the inside. Um, the two other barns, the the kind of the galvanized barn uh, where we keep the replacement lambs there, that barn is 36 by 120. Um, the bank barn, I'm not sure what it is, but it's actually a fairly large uh, barn for the era that was built in and on the upstairs of the bank barn is where we feed our market lambs. Yeah, so when we renovated the old barn, we had to redo all the posts and beams and the flooring. So we were able to use the upstairs. Um, it's all drivable via skid steer upstairs. And then yeah, we have the market lambs up there. So that was another way to make space um, and expand before we built the new barn. She the sheep don't go outside each day. The new barn feels like it's outside because once those sides are open, the curtains are open, um, it's pretty wide open and airy. Um, so we'll do breeding in the old bank barn. And once everyone is bred, they kind of go back into one group and go to the outside yard. So the outside yard is those cement J bunks, a bit of a dry lot. And there's an old shed there that uh, we put water to. Um, and then, yeah, the, the feed cart. Um, so we're doing the TMR feed, a stationary mixer, vertical mixer, and the feed cart can go to all those different pens in the outside yard and feed everyone. You can't see the, let's, I'll show you the book again. Uh, the indoor pens, uh, the new barn, it's cleaned out between each group. So um, usually every two months, the new barn gets cleaned out or a pen in the new barn gets cleaned out every two months. and and same with the other barns as well. Usually every month and a half to two months, um, the pens need cleaning out. Are there any other questions coming from our participants? You can also unmute yourself if you would like or prefer to ask a question on the microphone versus the chat box. No hard questions yet, Ryan. <laughs> I'll do another call out if there's any questions um, from participants. How often do we usually fed? Um, use with lambs um, kind of depends on weather, but 
um, at least every other day um, for use with lambs. Um, generally in the winter time, we'll do every day. Uh, I'd rather, I don't like seeing manure in the pens. I'd rather see lots of straw. So um, generally if we skip a bedding or two or or just let it go a little bit too long, then that's usually when we see mastitis pop up or flare up. Um, so that's the use with lambs. Uh, dry use um, once a week or once, once every, um, or every three, four days, uh, not quite as often with those. And you have to remember we're in Ontario, so we have a very humid cold in the winter, not a dry cold like in Alberta. Yeah. Today we're plus 32, but plus 40 with the humidex. So it's a- uh, There could be a lot of moisture in the air. Yeah. Uh, what have you done to me? We'll look at your, um, I guess I'm just a crazy wool lady. <laughs> I'm a very crafty artistic person. And I think I was able to sort of connect to the fiber kind of knitter world a bit. Um, you have a supportive fiber husband. You have, I have a supportive husband too. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it was kind of, you know, where it, and I think a lot of people always, you know, oh, it's just meat sheep wool, like that has no value, um, but there's nothing wrong with it. We just actually have to use it and market it and tell the story behind it. Um, like it's our wool soft enough to, to wear next to skin, you know, it, it's not, you can't compare it to something like a merino wool, anything like that. It's got its own, own unique qualities. Uh, yeah, and it's been really great for bedding. The pillows have been our best sellers. So um, yeah, it's taken a lot of time to build it up. Um, eight years ago, I think I got the first yarn spun, kind of the whole, oh, well, let's see what happens. And then there's just a little more and a more and more. And then yeah, about two years ago I rebranded and sort of made a bigger push for it and now I'm doing sort of artisan markets fiber markets I'm actually going to go to Toronto um, for five days in November for the big one of my kind Christmas show so that'll be a, a big thing that I'm looking forward to have you ever tried Folagon with natural breeding no we have not no and so the Rido's, we don't have any Rido use. We use Rido Rams on Dorset use to make our first F1 crosses. Um, how often do you completely clean the barn? Every other Every month ish. Month? Um, generally, it's more group based. Yeah, like it's it, more group, group, group based for cleaning out, um, but generally, um, I like everything will for sure get cleaned out all at once, kind of the end of October, beginning of November, just because that's kind of usually when our weather turns to snow or too wet. So just to get all the manure out onto our fields and then and then work in for the winter. Uh, we do not do our own shearing. Um, we get Charlie Cunningham to do it. Uh, I did shear once. I think I did it like for ewes one morning and I thought that was going great. So I did the ram and then it all went to hell after that. So uh, <laughs> anymore. No, uh, teaser rams. Yep. So yeah, I had talked about teaser rams. That's sort of standard procedure for us now is the, te the teaser rams. So teaser rams are in for two weeks before the real rams. Do you have anything to tell them? Do one more call out for any questions coming from our participants this evening. Um, did we design the barn ourselves? Uh, kind of, yes. Um, we also toured a few um, facilities that were recently built prior to when we built in the with that had the kind of the same size flock uh, that we're going to. And we just kind of took some ideas from here and there and, and kind of put them all together to, for what would work for us. Um, 
It's nothing fancy. Um, the layout's pretty simple. We have a lot of gates that we move around. So the pens can be split in different ways, um, that kind of thing. So we can be flexible with how we, how we use it, which has been really nice. So lots of gates. We have gates that kind of like lock into it. They're like a, I an eye and a hook on each on opposite sides, so we can kind of click stuff in wherever we need to. So it makes it really flexible. So I guess those. So the plan was to do the Rito Rams onto the Dorset use for the F1, and then do a Suffolk. We had some Suffolk Rams which one ended up dying and something didn't work so we just spread back to dorset and then when we expanded we brought in some use from shepherd's choice um so there are flock here in ontario that had kind of developed their own maternal prolific breed so their mix was what's on it? it's a dorset rideau tefron tefron is a new zealand mix of Texel, Romanoff, and Romney. There's Coopworth in there, and also some British milk sheep. So they're fairly similar to a Rideau. I find them a bit hardier. So that was how we brought back more prolific stuff. And now we're kind of doing those maternal prolifics, adding a bit of Dorset in, and then putting them back onto some new rams from that same flock. And we also played a little bit. We got some nice Tunis crosses. So we had bought in a couple of Tunis rams a few years ago. So now we have some nice Tunis cross ewe lambs and some rams. So those have worked really nice. The, the Tunis, I think, is a great mix. They have a similar lambing percent um, to Dorsets. They've got some good heat stress tolerance since they originate from the Middle East. And the really nice long animals, they've got like the they go through the shoot and you can tell who they are because and they they're that sort of the fat tailed sheep so when, when you push them through the shoot you're always grabbing a tail and then you notice like do they have two extra ribs or something like they're just so long um so i think they're a great match just to add a little bit of hybrid vigor in there too we like cross breeding um but yeah we're keeping some of those dorset dorset lines pure too um, we did some AI with semen from Australia for the Dorsets, and that's worked out really nice for sire. Um, we've been really happy with that. Do you have something to tell them too? No. They've got big plans for taking over. And there you go. Oh, hold on. Do you think you're able to animal husbandry and economics? Yes. Um, if the animals aren't well looked after, it's not going to work out financially. So we have to make sure the animals are healthy. Um, or I don't know, maybe you may, feel free to put on your mic. Maybe you want to elaborate on that question too. So adding bedding every day or a couple of days, depending on the U group. Um, so maybe a better way to answer the bedding question is bed them when it's needed, because it really will depend on how much, you know, like a lactating you, she's peeing more. So the pen's going to be wetter. The lactating you, you have to consider that her lambs are also in that pen. They're drinking a lot more water versus a dry you. Um, if you sit in that pen or kneel in that pen and your knees get wet, give them straw. Um, so yeah, it just all depends. Depends on the straw quality too. Um, wheat straws not quite as absorbable as a barley straw. You know, it, de it depends on how you're doing it. Okay. <laughs> Which joke should I do? Okay, uh, my best sheep joke. Uh, why did the ram jump off the cliff? Because he didn't see the U-turn. <laughs> that one is... It, I, it, it was, there was a funny situation. So my dad, my parents are Swiss and my dad, I told this joke to my dad and a buddy of his and they understood the answer and they're dairy farmers 
and they understood the answer to be they didn't or the ram didn't cedar the u-turn so then it turned into this whole discussion about cedars and u's and they didn't understand why the ram jumped because she was cedared not see her <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a good one. Might have to use that. <laughs> uh, well, I guess we're kind of right around time um, for the webinar this evening. Uh, so um, I'd like to uh, sincerely thank um, the both of you to Ryan and Romy um, and to all of our participants who joined us this evening. Um, this will conclude our webinar, and I will send an email to everyone who registered for this evening's session that will include a link to where you can access the webinar recording. Thanks for having us. And yeah, feel free to reach out if you've ever got any questions or want to chat. Yes, thank you very much. We really appreciate the time. I know with the time difference, it's a little late there. So thank you very much for, for doing this for um, our Alberta producers. It, it was great. Not a problem. All right. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.